Negro. They called Africans who they had enslaved, they called them Negros, right? They were saying, and at one time they also said piezas, which means pieces, like things. But the idea is, again, to say, you don't have personhood. I've made you into a thing. And I literally mean thing. I made you into a thing. What does Dr. Pimienta Bay mean by making you into a thing? Is he referring to a metaphoric comparison to property, cattle, livestock? Or is this a play off the word black? Black being a word which implies something that doesn't even have life. Or is Dr. Pimienta Bay also referring to something much more menacing? The answer is yes to all three. To expound on this, let's refer to history and a little-known quote from a prominent American figurehead. It is but justice to the fruitfulness of that period to mention two other important events, the Lutheran Reformation in 1517, and still earlier, the invention of Negroes, or of the present mode of using them in 1434. Inventions and Discoveries, April 6, 1858 by Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of the United States of America. To start, we must look at the etymology of the word Negro. The, the etymology of a word is facts of the origin and development of a word spanning time and languages the history and the evolution of a word. The etymology of Negro, from Spanish or Portuguese, Negro, Black, from Latin Negro, Gloomy, Unlucky, Bad, Wicked. Can you see how the word Negro and its meaning was simply applied to our people by would-be oppressors? In his lecture, Lincoln states, the present mode of using the Negro wasn't in existence before 1434. This suggests people of darker complexion didn't answer to the term Negro before 1434. The use of the word Negro to describe people is less than 600 years old. The Constitution gives me war powers. But no one knows just exactly what those powers are. Some say they don't exist. I don't know. I decided I needed them to exist to uphold my oath to protect the Constitution, which I decided meant that I could take the rebel slaves from them as property confiscated in war. 
That might recommend a suspicion that I agree with the Rebs that they're slaves of property in the first place. Of course, I don't ever have. Glad to see any man free, and if calling a man property or war contraband does the trick, why I caught at the opportunity. Now, here's where it gets truly slippery. I use the law allowing for the seizure of property in a war, knowing it applies only to the property of governments and citizens of belligerent nations. The South ain't a nation. That's why I can't negotiate. So if in fact the Negroes are property according to law, have I the right to take the rebels' property from them if I insist they're rebels only and not citizens of a belligerent country? It's slipperier still, I maintain it ain't our actual southern states in rebellion but only the rebels living in those states. The laws of which states remain in force. The laws of which states remain in force. That means that since it's states' laws that determine whether Negroes can be sold as slaves as property, the federal government doesn't have a say in that. It's not yet. Noble Drew Ali and Abraham Lincoln clearly understood the history of events which turned people into inventions. The name of these inventions, Negroes. Since inventions are not considered human, they could be owned, sold, traded, and discarded like property to be handled as things. Lincoln closes his presentation, Inventions and Discoveries, with full appreciation to the patent which was invented with the adoption of the U.S. Constitution. The patent system secured to the inventor for a limited time, the exclusive use of his invention, and thereby added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius in the discovery and production of new and useful things. For clarity, the aim here is not to slander Abraham Lincoln. The aim is to illustrate what the common thought and comprehension was of previous eras, to better understand the origins of this black epidemic and offer its cure. Because Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States of America, his words and ideas have been well documented. This offers tremendous insight for so-called black people. But was Lincoln Negro? According to definition, absolutely not. Yet it is likely that Lincoln did not have pale skin. In order to comprehend this statement, you must recall black and Negro for that matter, is not about complexion. It's about class and status. And Abraham Lincoln stands as a shining example to this issue. The penny, which bears Lincoln's profile, is the only coin in circulation in the USA that has a copper makeup. Is this a coincidence? Hardly. You may ask, so Lincoln's half black, or mulatto. He's neither of those. Mulatto translates to mule in English and alludes to the idea of being half human, half beast. Once again, the beast being something owned, controlled, sold, or discarded as desired. It's not about complexion. It's about class and status. Negro is a label invented by Europeans or so-called whites to turn men into mere commodities. Black being an offspring of Negro carries the same weight of Negro even into modern times. Lincoln's contemporaries knew the distinction between Negroes and free copper-skinned people. The deeper we dig, the more evidence we find that these free copper-toned people in America were Moors. This becomes crystal clear with an even lesser known event in history. A jaw-dropping court case, which happened almost a decade before Lincoln became president. We'll uncover this hush-hush story in the next chapter of Black Epidemic. Peace and love.